Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with UK jazz saxophonist and composer Karen Sharp. She was born in Suffolk in the UK and developed a love of music very early on. That would lead her to taking up the piano and clarinet, and then she would start writing music and working for local music groups. After graduating in composition at the Royal Northern College of Music, she discovered a love of jazz and was inspired to play the tenor sax by two giants, Dexter Gordon and Sonny Rollins. After moving to London in 2000, her career took off when she worked and joined the Humphrey Littleton's band. He's a comedian and a musician out there in the UK, and that was a great ride for her around Europe for four years. This gave her a great deal of exposure and led to many great things. She talked about all of that and her latest 2018 CD, The Sun, The Moon, and You. So get to know her and dig this interview, my friends. Karen, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure. I, I checked out your website. It just looks great. You know, I haven't had a chance to do any reading, but you've got so many interesting interviews. So I'm, I'm going to be having a look through. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it's it, it's a labor of love. There's a lot of good stuff going on in the world. Yeah. So let's talk about your latest project, the sun, the moon, and you. And I want to know what your artistic vision with this project was. I, I think my my thing has always been looking for tunes and melodies i i come from a background of um composition sort of classical really a long long time ago and i'm always attracted to strong melodies i think tom harrell is just a master of you know one of the modern masters really of you know of great tunes that i think are going to last um and yeah and they're, they're hugely challenging <laughs> to much more challenging than they sound to play and i'm kind of attracted to, so I, I'm attracted to that kind of strong melody with, with, with a harmonic basis that, that is just really, really tricky and you've got to find strong lines that, that work with the harmony. So that's kind of, that's, I suppose it's like a big puzzle to me and I've kind of surrounded myself with like-minded musicians, friends actually um, and we've been working together for, for a, quite a long time now. So um, yeah, we, we were gigging around, we've been we made our first album in 2011. Since then, I've been gigging around the UK um, at festivals and things, and finally we made our second album last year. Yeah, so a lot of the tunes are very well bedded in, um, which is which is great, and we all, obviously, we know each other's playing back to front, so it's, it's just a real pleasure, and it, there's quite a lot of flexibility, you know, between us as a result. So I want to go back to the beginning of your life. You were born in Suffolk. And you developed a love of music early on. Your first instruments were the piano and the clarinet. Talk to me about your childhood and how you got into music. What was going on around you that lent to that? I don't know if it's strange or not. It feels odd to me. I don't have any musicians in my family. I was about seven when I first, I think I just was messing around on a relative's piano. But nobody really played. And my parents, as a result of this, just got me started on piano lessons and then very shortly after an early teacher at school I mean I was only probably eight eight or nine advised I'd take up a second instrument which is amazing advice really to be given at that age <laughs> um so I had so I took up clarinet as well and kind of went from there I went did all the, the classical route did all the grades and and sort of played in the the local youth orchestra and finally went to music college to study composition and it was all classical but I think sort of running parallel to that, I was, I was I was kind of attracted to jazz and I'd heard bits and pieces because my senior school teacher was a jazz saxophonist and he, he, he kind of, he sort of helped me. I remember him giving me a couple of written out solos, you know, I liked, but I didn't really, I didn't really get into it until a little bit later. Um, so I was sort of classical really. Um, I, I think my, my whole family are probably musical if you gave them an instrument, they'd probably, you know, pick it up quite quickly, but they just never have done that. So it's, it's just been me, really. <laughs> <laughs> so your inspiration on the tenor was Dexter Gordon and Sonny Rollins. Were those early influences, early albums you listened to, or along with them, who influenced you jazz-wise? Well, I mean, I think Dexter, initially, I remember um, getting into him really early well I say really early I was about 22 I was at college and we'd, we had been transcribing bits from 
one of his great albums, Go, which I, I absolutely love. Uh, I think it would be transcribing Cheesecake and Love for Sale. Um, it's just really nice. His playing is, is, I like to think of it sort of like in primary colours. It's very, very clear, really strong. It's quite relatively easy to transcribe and understand harmonically what he's doing. So I think, yeah, so he was like a great one initially. I was able to play along and, and it kind of, and I've always been sort of, I suppose I've always been attracted to that kind of strong rhythmic playing, you know, as in Sonny Rollins as well. I'm just trying to think early contemporary players. I, I think when I first started playing tenor, um, I was listening to a lot of Joshua Redman and I was listening to Joe Henderson as well, who I've just kind of gone back to having had a bit of a break, but um, I absolutely love Joe's playing. Yeah, and also loads of um, multi-instrumentalists. I mean, I've, I've always loved listening to, to piano players. Whilst I'm not a jazz pianist, you know, piano was my first love really so yeah I'm quite happy I could always listen to just piano players and not sax I mean I always tell my students to kind of widen their um, listening to include all the instruments you know um, because there's so much to take from from all of them yeah so I love that I love one of my favorite albums is um, Stan Getz and Kenny Barron um, just the duo stuff is just phenomenal I, i'm quite happy listening to all that kind of stuff once you relocated to london in 2000 you got yeah. involved with humphrey littleton's band and you toured the uk and europe for about four years that had to be a That's huge right. learning curve for you yeah it was um i don't know how much you he's known in america really but he's i mean sadly passed away about just over 10 years uh, 10 years ago um he was a quite quite a big figure, and not only as a jazz trumpet player, but he was also um, a host of a radio comedy show, like a quiz comedy show over here called Sorry I Haven't a Clue. And so he was a bit of a cult figure, and everywhere we went, it was absolutely packed. <laughs> People were queuing to see the band, which was absolutely amazing. And I was so lucky. I mean, we, we played all the, you know, lovely theatres and um, some of the bigger clubs and, and things around the country. Yeah, I learned an awful lot from him. He's very, he had very good um, stage presence. He he was always, he could kind of turn it on. I mean, he was, when I was playing with him, he was in his mid-80s when I first met him. And he looked incredibly frail to me initially. But I got kind of, as I got to know him, I realised he wasn't at all. And he, I remember him standing in the wings and he'd been, he used to drive everywhere. He was like a, he was an amazing, strong um, man. And he used to drive to gigs sometimes feeling poorly but he'd go on the stage and you'd, you'd never know and he just kind of he kind of grew on the stage he was a tall man anyway but he had this massive presence and he was always really able to, to kind of get the audience in the palm of his hand really just by saying a few words he didn't have to do much at all because he had an amazing voice <laughs> hmm. um so yeah i learned i mean i learned a lot about how to program and and you know you kind of working a balance between playing your creative getting your creative juices going but also you are entertaining you know and you need to kind of keep the audience on side so I mean he was quite good at including new pieces by band members in concerts and sandwiching in between you know familiar stuff you know so no one got too frightened but he, he yeah he, he was very good at programming and he was also I mean yeah he's a fantastic musician so um, I learned an awful lot about you know uh, about the craft and about the history and um, in particular I suppose G. Kellington he was really really interested in and that rubbed off on me as well so yeah I'm forever grateful for that opportunity well and you played with a lot of other people like John Dankworth and Jeremy Pelt there's been so many people that you we would consider veterans in the jazz world what did you learn from them that have that, that you impart to your students now? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. I think a lot of my, well, I mean, think people like John Dankworth. I was very fortunate to work with him towards the end of his life. I think I took from him most mostly was was the thing about writing, and and he was. I mean, he was an amazing um, artist in all senses. I mean, his writing was was just really beautiful stuff it was lovely to play really really nice to play um, and I think from that point of view well for my writing and and if I'm you know passing on information to students it will always you know I kind of 
really important to to consider the musicians that you're writing for to know your instruments and you know you, you don't want to um be producing music that's difficult to play for the sake of it and it, you know it's kind of got to be comfortable and within the range and and or, or, you know kind of technical stuff but john was just a master at that so i think that's what i took from him mainly i mean I'm, it was a shame i didn't know him better i knew him probably two or three years um towards the end of his life um he was very very supportive yeah so we and we, we used to rehearse a lot for his gigs so i mean i'm quite a fan of rehearsing so and i do do it with my students if i'm involved in workshops or summer courses i'm really interested in getting to the nuts and bolts and you know trying to make sure everyone is knows exactly what they're doing and i think rehearsing is a good thing so so i've taken that from from john and um, i mean jeremy i i was fortunate to meet and work with in um cape town with a singer called esther miller who's uh, an old friend who's now living in denmark i believe but she's yeah so we i mean it, it was a shame because jeremy turned up and we just we just did the gig we had we had the week but sadly it was just the one gig but he was just yeah he played played beautifully and for him to just turn up you know there's no preparation no chance to kind of have much of a sound check or anything and he was just a true professional so yeah i mean it's that's a lesson for all of us i think and in fact i'd love to see jeremy again i must must look him up because it's been too long <laughs> yeah so yeah. you tend to tour quite a bit and get around the world do you like getting out in front of different cultures and audiences and performing yeah yeah i do absolutely i mean it's i've had i suppose the most unusual audience was was in japan i think i was a bit jet lagged and i was a little bit green at the time i hadn't done that much traveling with work and i was with good friends and amazing musicians tina may who's a singer and nikki isles pianist and we the three of us went over to do a festival in tokyo and we, yeah it's just amazing how the response to how, how the audience were responding to solos and they were all sort of clapping in, in unison, you know, completely together. And it was really strange. We, it took a while to get used to it, but it was just amazing. When they're mad for it in Japan, I mean, we had, we had such a good reception, really. And uh, and I know that, you know, there's always been a big, big jazz following over there. So, yeah, it's really interesting. And I've done quite a lot of work in France where... I don't know, it's a different vibe. I suppose the audiences are a bit younger than they are in, in the UK, certainly for the kind of gigs I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, you get more varied audience and they they kind of play in maybe smaller, more interesting venues in a way. They've got, I, I always think there's more, much more historic uh, historic buildings and there's, I don't know, it's kind of, it always seems a bit more exotic in France. But it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's a different mentality i think and you, you get a lot of younger people coming out to gigs and you know really into it um yeah so it's been amazing to travel i mean i hope i'm going to do some more i did go to singapore and had some, a great time working with some students over there where we were teaching f for a week on and off various groups as well as playing and it was yeah it was just amazing to to hear you know their interpretations of, of great american you know songbook standards and it, it, was, it was brilliant really really lovely experience and it's you know wherever you go in the world it, of course it's universal language so you haven't got to work too hard to be able to communicate with with people of all, all nationalities the one thing that's good about seeing live shows is it's almost an education so early on in your life what jazz shows did you see that left a real deep impact on you um i went my dad took me to a few of the local jazz club gigs way before i was playing sax I'm not really sure why he took me i must have i was playing a bit of ragtime on the piano and i kind of i think that's you know, so there was the beginnings of an interest. I think Dad was into it as well. I mean, there was no specific person, but I just remember the sort of vibe. I liked the fact that it was informal. I mean, I'd, I'd been involved in lots of sort of com not competitions and um, concerts and what have you with you know in classical um, music with the school and things, um, which weren't so informal. And I was quite attracted to that. This jazz club was kind of dark and it was long and it had a long bar and um yeah just just people who seemed to be having a really really good time i mean musicians were 
I, I was bowled over by it. So, I mean, those, those experiences must have gone in at the time. I didn't, as I say, I didn't play, but it was all a bit of a mystery. And it wasn't until I started to play and, and went to a few gigs, you know, having having pr- been practicing for a while, I really understood what was going on. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it started in Ipswich. Probably I was probably about mid-teens, I would say. Cool. Mid, to, mid to late teens. I was quite late. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it's better late than never, and I always hear that it tends to be on the later curve of things when people really grab jazz and, and get their head wrapped yeah. around it. Well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And I think, well, for me, it's, it's ongoing. I mean, I don't, it, you know, it's just, I just really, really love learning and hearing new players and, you know, I love practicing. I, lo- I love all of it. So it's, it's just like being at school for your whole life, really. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> So, yeah. are you happy with where your career is now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, people say to me, are you busy? And I usually say, I'm as busy as I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> um, because sometimes I feel like I could work perhaps harder or... I don't know, I suppose, yeah, I'm reasonably busy and it's been up and down probably... I don't know how long, maybe 15 years, and I've been, I was really lucky with Humps, I got loads and loads of exposure, and then really since then I haven't had to work too hard to secure gigs for for whatever band I'm, I'm doing at that time. I mean, sadly, we have to get our own gigs, you know, I think it's the same all over the world probably, but it's, um, so it's not always easy, I'm not, not particularly good at selling myself, but... I'm getting better as I get older. <laughs> yep. That's one advantage of getting older. Yeah, it is. Um, you just kind of find your own voice and, and get on with it because you have to. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'm doing quite a lot more writing at the moment. And um, I'm doing, I'm also going back a little bit to my compositional roots, as in classical composition and kind of, yeah, listening a lot more to some more contemporary classical music yeah I've got quite a broad taste so yeah it's good at the moment I've got lots of time so I'm I'm kind of yeah I'm exploring lots of different areas which is great absolutely why do you love jazz oh why do I love jazz it's to me it's probably about the people it's it's I mean you don't I I suppose I didn't know initially it was oh it's quite fun to play over some changes or whatever but as you kind of as you get to know musicians and work in different groups. I just, I love the characters I've met. I've, I've met so many amazing musicians and, you know, the, the ones that I work with regularly are, it's, well, it's, it's hard to describe. It, you've, you've got this thing, you know, and it's, you just have, yeah, it's, it's immense fun. It's, it's exhilarating, you know, it's very, very personal, it's intimate. It's, it's just all these things. And I think probably most of the music that I love is just as much about the people as about the music but you know it's kind of one one can't be without the other kind of like Ellington Ellington's band yeah really um yeah it's about the characters and I think think about past gigs and I always think it's always about the music and the person behind it so I think that's quite a special thing and you don't you don't get that in many walks of life you don't get kind of group activities where you're kind of communicating without words you're just pl- you know you're just kind of playing floating along and you're all kind of got the same goal and the fact that you can obviously do it in you know I can go over to France and play with lots of guys and it's just as good you know we yeah. can't necessarily chat as much but um, you don't you don't need to yeah so I think it's about the people and I remember meeting and, and working a bit with great baritone and tenor player Scott Robinson who I absolutely adore and he's yeah I mean he's talking of great characters he's one of them and it just comes out in his playing and it does you know you meet you meet people who are quirky in some way or another and it it really does come out in their playing and that that's what i love i don't think you can avoid it everything is going to come down to this final question for you to get kind of the essence of who you are and everyone has a perception or an interpretation of who you are your family your friends Mm -hmm. your fans but you know who you are tell me who do you think you are Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's really tricky. Who do I think I am? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, it, yeah, it's, it, it, it gets to the root of things. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I would say that I'm, I think I, I, I'm, I can be quite steely and, and I think strong. Um, but I don't always come across that way, I would say. So my playing, that's why I'm attracted to 
what I was initially attracted to, Dexter, for example. Yeah, I like the big sounds of the tenor and the baritone. I'm attracted to that kind of strength. Um, I think I've got some of that in me. Um, yeah, I know, I know it's not always visible. Yeah, and, and I think as I've got older, it's become more visible and I've become more comfortable with it. So it's, yeah, I think that's, it's, it's quite an important thing to think about. I'll have to give it some more thought. Yeah. No, that's a good answer. You, <laughs> that's a good answer. And it's funny because when I opened up your website and saw the photo and got the vibe, what you described in that first sentence is exactly what I got from that. So it, it, it makes sense. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Totally. Good. You conveyed that. So, hey, thank you for taking a minute out to talk with Neon Jazz. Thank you for your music. I appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks a lot. Lovely to speak to you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players in the UK, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Karen for her time, her music, and her stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. <laughs> Neon Jazz.